Hello and welcome. A small analysis of the INI set November 22 exam questions before we come to discussion of the actual questions asked in microbiology. So we had two sessions for a change. And I believe in that in microbiology, the questions in both the sessions were almost of the same difficulty levels. 50% of the questions were image based and about 60 to 70% of the question, in fact, 70 to 80% of the questions were, of, uh, were asked from topics which have been asked again and again in the last five to seven years exams, right? And most of the topics which were asked lower, you know, like, you know, you can easily predict which are the, these important topics in the INI set exam, okay? So keeping in mind those things, let's move on to the topics which were asked. So I've divided them section wise. So from general microbiology and general bacteriology, we had questions with regards to microscopes. It's a very commonly asked question, predictable. Then we had question on sterilization and disinfection. Very, again, a very commonly asked topic, staining and morphology of bacteria. From systemic bacteriology, we had questions from rickettsia and related genera. A very, in fact, two questions we were asked and spirochetes, again, a commonly asked topic. Virology had the maximum number of questions which were asked. Okay, so we had question on genome, segmented genome, again, very commonly asked, morphology of viruses, parvovirus, human papilloma viruses, hepatitis B and hepatitis D, co-infection, super-infection, COVID-19. Then we had a question on endemicity of viral infections. And also we had questions on viral infections associated with vesicular rash and petechial rash. Moving on to parasitology, uh, we had a question each from Plasmodium, Hymenolepis nana, Tinea, and Coccidian protozoa. Again, commonly asked topic, Coccidian and H. nana. From mycology, two commonly asked topics, chromoblastomycosis and sporotrichosis, in fact, sporotrichoid type of lesions. And finally, immunology, one of the toughest questions which are asked in INI set are of topics uh, from the topic of immunology. We had a question, a direct question from hereditary angioneurotic edema, and we had questions from B cells and cells, right? So just keep this in mind with regards to your preparation for the NEAT exams. At present, we are doing section one questions, okay? Right, let's get going with the questions. Match the following disease or organism with the stains which are used to demonstrate them. Malaria, tuberculosis, leprosy, actinomyces. So which are the stains which are used to demonstrate them? The answer to this question is for malaria diagnosis, generally we use Jemsa stain. For tuberculosis, we use the ZN stain. For leprosy, fight Faraco stain. This is a basically a modified ZN stain for tissue sections. Modified Zeal Nielsen stain, stain for tissue sections. Okay, and for actinomyces, we use the Gram stain. Right. So for plasmodium, the causative agent of malaria, we use generally the Romanowski stains. OK, so which are the Romanowski stains? We can use Jemsa, Leishman, Field or Wright stain. A modification of Jemsa stain is a faster version, which is called as just one sing and Bhattacharya stain. OK, so this is what is used in our country because we have so many peripheral smears to look for plasmodium. So we don't want to waste the long time of Jemsa, which is almost half an hour in comparison to GSB, which just takes about five minutes. For mycobacterium species, tuberculosis or leprae, we use the acid fast stain, the ZN stain and the Kinyon stain, Gabbett stain or the cold stain. They both mean all three of them are synonyms where we are not using the step of heating. And those are the acid fast bacteria, you can see those pink bacteria, pink rods against a blue background. Okay, as I said earlier, the fight Faraco stain is a modified version of the uh, ZN stain for tissue sections. Right, and then just keep in mind, uh, we also have fluorescent uh, dyes or fluorescent stain to use uh, for demonstrating mycobacteria. And which are these which have the ability to bind to mycolic acids present in the cell wall of mycobacteria? These are uh, oramine O and rhodamine 
B, okay? So of course, if we have a fluorescent microscope, we would like to rather use the fluorescent dyes instead of the usual ZN stain because using fluorescent dyes reduces our time uh, for analysis of the smears by one fifth. Moving on to actinomyces, we can see used, we generally use the gram stain. What is actinomyces morphology? You can see that beautiful, slender, branching, gram positive rods. Next question, the microscopy technique that can be utilized to produce high contrast images of, transport sp uh, of transparent specimen, especially such as living cells, okay? Which one of them? Phase contrast microscopy, dark ground microscopy, polarized light microscopy, and electron microscopy, right? So now here we have living cells, okay? Please remember in electron microscope, we are using vacuum because we are using electrons. If we are using atmospheric air, it's going, all the electrons are going to get diverted here and there. So vacuum is an important part of the electron microscope. Obviously, whatever we are seeing under the electron microscope is going to be dead. So no chance of you seeing living cells under them. So our answer to this question is phase contrast microscopy. Yes, in dark ground microscopy, we can see living cells, but they don't provide such a beautiful contrast as is provided by the phase contrast microscope, okay, right? Polarized light microscopy is not used generally in our laboratories. They are used in industries where they want to find out how much, what a type of elements are present in certain metals, okay? So this is our bright field microscope image. If it is a living cell, that's the kind of image we get. And look at the beautiful contrast, which is provided by the phase contrast microscope. Right. So phase contrast microscope almost looks like a dark, uh, sorry, a bright field microscope. But only thing that is different is it has two extra components. The condenser that has an annular, sorry, the condenser has an annular ring on uh, just in front of it. Right. So that is a annular ring. Can you see that red structure? This is also a part of the dark ground microscope. And another thing is the phase plate. Okay, so basically remember what is the principle of a phase contrast microscope that as light, you know, of course, the light is used as light passes through the internal structures. These internal structures have different refractive indices. So as it is passing through those structures with different refractive indices, there are produce changes in phase of light, okay? So their amplitude keeps on changing as it is passing through different structures. And these changes in phase of light are, uh, you know, they are uh, manifested as changes in light intensity by use of this phase plate, okay? So this provides high contrast images. Next question, a microbiologist performed a tissue gram stain and found th thin filamentous bacteria as are shown in this figure. What other staining techniques should be done to confirm the diagnosis as nocardia? So bears, basically they are telling us that this is nocardia that we are seeing in this uh, a tissue section. And what else can we use? Which other staining technique can we use in this? We remember that nocardia is partially acid fast. Okay. So what is this answer? Modified acid fast stain. Okay. So whenever you see any picture, any image in your exams or wherever, under the microscope, please, whenever you see these gram positive filamentous rods, which are showing branches, what are we going to think of? We are going to think of the family actinomycetes. And we have two very important pathogenic members out here. One is actinomyces and the other one is nocardia. Now, don't confuse actinomyces with the family actinomycetes. This is a genus, as is nocardia. Okay, and actinomyces and nocardia, how are they different from each other apart from a very important differentiating character that these are generally anaerobes, whereas nocardia are strict aerobes. Actinomyces is non-acid fast, whereas nocardia is acid fast with 0.5 to 1% of sulfuric acid. Okay, so... That is why it was written as modified ZN stain. What is the difference? Here we are not using 20% of sulfuric acid as the decolorizer. We are using a much lower concentration of sulfuric acid as the decolorizer. The nocardia will retain the primary stain and they will appear these, these pink rods against a blue background. This is the modified acid fast or the modified ZN stain.
peripheral blood smear of a patient, I'm sorry, presenting with fever, headache, and malaise showed the presence of monocytes with a morula as shown in this figure. Now, this is a fantastic question. Hats off to the examiner who is testing you. I mean, it's a topic which is not normally asked, Alicia, etc. Yes, we do get questions on rickettsia. We get questions on orientia, coxiella, bartonella. But this is a rare question. In fact, most of the time I don't tell my students, this is a one in thousands question. So give less importance to it. And we got a question in I and I said, okay, so here we have a monocyte, we, it's, which is uh, showing this morula, which of the following is the likely cause of the symptoms in the patient? Rickettsia coronary, Rickettsia acari, Alicia chaffinsis, and anaplasma phagocytophilum. The answer to this is Alicia chaffinsis. Now, whenever you read this word morula, this word morula is basically means it means mulberry, mulberry. So we are seeing these mulberry shaped inclusion bodies inside the cells, inside these blood cells. Okay, so immediately think of a member of the family, anaplasma tesi. Anaplasma tesi is the bigger family in which we have these three important genera which cause human diseases, Alicia, Anaplasma and Neorickettsia. Now, unlike most members of the family Rickettsiaceae, CAC, which are closely related to Anaplasma tesi, those Rickettsia members, they generally localize where, where do, what do we learn about them? They parasitize endothelial cells, whereas Anaplasma tesi, they parasitize the blood cells, right? So what are these? Alicia chaffinsis, Alicia canis, and Alicia muris. They parasitize the monocytotropic, uh, sorry, they parasitize the uh, monocyte. So they cause human monocytotropic alicosis, whereas Alicia evingae and Alicia phagocytophilum, they parasitize the granulocytes, hence causing human granulocytotropic alicosis or anaplasmosis. Okay, so in this question, we had a question, we had the monocyte carrying the molura. So obviously, our answer would be either of these. And the question mentioned the option of Alicia chaffinsis. Okay, so a similar question will be asked in section two. A forest guard returned from the forest and few days later presented with a skin lesion as shown in this figure. Which of the following is the likely diagnosis? What do you see? There is a central black scar and what is it called as scab? And this is called as Eshkar. Eshkar. Okay. So we are basically being asked what is the likely diagnosis in this patient who has an Eshkar and this patient has returned from the forest. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, scrub typhus, malaria, COVID-19. The answer to this question is scrub typhus. Now, this was asked in July INI set 21, in which they had said all of the following can be causes of the same, this kind of lesion, except here we have been given only one as the likely cause. Okay. So please remember Eshkar, which is also called as Takenoir, this kind of lesion, you know, um, a central black scarring is seen. This is seen in the following conditions. One is cutaneous anthrax or malignant pustule, also called as Hyde Porter's disease, which is due to bacillus anthracis. Then we come to spotted fever rickettsiosis, like Indian tick typhus, rickettsial pox, Kenyan tick typhus, botanus fever. All of them present with this eshkar at the site of the bite of the tick. But exception is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, in which Eshkar is generally not seen. Yes, scrub typhus again manifests at the site of the bite of the sugars of the mite, that is, this kind with this kind of lesion. And finally, at the site of brown recluse spider bite, we see a similar lesions. Right? So those are the causes of Eshkar. A 30-year-old male diagnosed with secondary syphilis was treated with treated with benzathine penicillin. Six hours after the penicillin dose, the patient has developed fever, chills, flushing, myalgias, headache, and tachycardia. jaris herxheimer reaction is diagnosed. All of the following cytokines are responsible except. Now, please remember that all spirochetosis, human spirochetosis like syphilis or it could be leptospirosis or it could be relapsing fever or Lyme's disease. 
many patients following the start of the treatment within the first 12 to 24 hours patient presents with this kind of a reaction and what is it due to it so first let me let me just tell you the answer the answer to this is all of the following cytokines are responsible except the answer to this is interferon gamma has no role in this jarish herxheimer reaction okay so whenever we treat the spirochetal infections right after for the treatment the spirochetes start to die and as a result of which there is release of endotoxin as well as lipoproteins from the cell wall of these spirochetes and this induces an immune response associated with the release of the following cytokines interleukin 6 interleukin 8 and tumor necrosis factor alpha interferon gamma is not released okay as a result of which you will see that there is exacerbation of the symptoms that the patient already had at the start of the treatment along with fever chills nausea vomiting rigor tachycardia and all these kinds of symptoms okay so please remember these are the cytokines so in this sec session we had a question on uh, a patient of secondary of syphilis being treated in the next session we will have a question of leptospirosis presenting with the similar symptoms okay so session one and session two had almost similar questions but very smartly they had the topics were the same but the questions were slightly different from each other next question hereditary angioneurotic edema is due to the deficiency of which of the following i believe this is the easiest question in the INS set exam so what is the answer it is the uh, the answer is c1 inhibitor which is causing hereditary angioneurotic edema which is an autosomal dominant condition because which in which the patient you know following certain stimuli which could be any kind of emotional stress or sometimes physical stress patient has recurrent attacks of non-pitting non-pruritic skin swellings along with painful abdominal attacks and laryngeal edema now why is this patient having these symptoms the reason is what is first of all let us find out what is the role of c1 inhibitor which is also called as c1 esterase inhibitor also called as serpin now in the classical complement pathway you must be remembering that is activation what happens is whenever there is formation of antigen antibody complexes the c1 q r2 s2 complex goes and binds to the fc part of this bound antibody okay so fc part sorry this is the fc part of the bound antibody okay this is our c1 complex and this leads to the activation of c1r followed by the activation of c1s and this leads to the cleavage of c4 and c2 and so on you please go back to the classical complement pathway if you don't remember it now what is the role of the c1 inhibitor so it says okay after some time of the activation of the classical pathway it uh, it breaks down or it proteolizes, it separates out the C1Q from C1R2S2 complex, preventing the further generation of C4, C2, C3 and so on. Okay, So it's basically one of the regulatory proteins of the classical complement pathway. Right Now, whenever there is C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency, there is uncontrolled generation of the enzymatically active C1R and C1S. As a result of which, there is massive proteolysis of C4 and C2, leading to massive increase in generation of C3A and C5A, which are both anaphyla toxins. Another important role of the C1 inhibitor is uh, in the generation of the bradykinin. Now, normally what happens is calicrin helps in the conversion of the high molecular weight kininogen to bradykinin, but C1 esterase, it controls the activity of calicrin. It reduces the generation of bradykinin. So whenever there is deficiency of the C1 inhibitor, there is uncontrolled activity of calicrin, massive increase in bradykinin. And what is it going to lead to? It is going to lead to increased vascular permeability, vasodilatation, pain, natriuresis, contraction of the non-vascular smooth muscles. And both these are further enhanced by what was generated by the classical complement pathway, the anaphylatoxins C3A and C5A. And that's why the patient presents with all those symptoms. Okay, So these are the two 
things which are important. A massive generation of bradykinin and C3A and C5. So this was regarding hereditary angioneurotic edema. edema. Let's learn some more important complement component deficiencies, which can be prospective questions. This is very, very important. Terminal complement component deficiencies, what do they lead to? Increased susceptibility to miseria infections. Decay accelerating factor or and CD59, which is also called as protectin, their deficiency, it leads to paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. C3 deficiency leads to increased in incidence of infections with pyogenic bacteria. And the earlier complement components like C1, C2 and C4 de deficiency leads to impaired clearance of immune complexes leading to SLE like disease. Okay. Next question, one of the toughest questions. This has been asked several years ago in the AIMS exam, about seven to eight years ago it was asked. A B cell can express two classes of antibody bodies as its receptor. Yes, we know that the B cell receptor is IgM and IgD. These have the same antigenic specificity. This is due to which of the following phenomenon? Allelic exclusion, somatic hypermutation, alternate RNA splicing, and affinity maturation. The answer to this question is alternate RNA splicing. Now, let me explain this. Many of you may be, I mean, it's a topic which I've discussed in my immunology lectures in Marrow, but most of you don't uh, skip that part where I've talked about the tougher things of adaptive immunity. Let me just briefly explain this here. So, Basically, we know that there are millions and millions of B cells which are circulating in our body meant to recognize totally different antigens. So they all have a different antigenic specificity. But one single B cell will recognize only one single antigen. So one single B cell has about 1.5 into 10 raised to power 5 B cell receptors on its surfaces. Okay, this These are of two classes, IgM and IgD. Okay, now these are, since they are present on one single B cell, they will have the same antigenic specificity. They will bind to the same antigen. What does this mean? That their variable part, which is res responsible for recognizing the antigen. This is the B cell receptor. That's our IgM antibody. What is, and this is IgT antibody. Now stop this video at this time and look, what is the difference between these two receptors? What is the difference? Their VL, the variable part of light chain and variable part of heavy chain is going to be absolutely the same. Why? Because they are present on a single B cell, obviously they have the same antigenic specificity. What is the difference between them? The difference is in the constant part of the heavy chain. So this is what heavy chain? This is mu heavy chain and this is delta heavy chain. That is what is different between them. Okay, so they are asking us what gives the B cell, what is that special phenomenon which gives the B cell the ability to express these kinds of two receptors which are different with each other from this. Okay, so that the answer to this is what we just talked about, alternate RNA splicing. Now, uh, please remember that we have a restricted number of genes in our uh, heavy chain locus and the light chain locus and each of you know, uh, I'll just show you on the next slide so we have the ability to recognize millions of antigens by the circulation of the millions of B cells each having a different antigenic specificity how can we generate these so many different B cell receptors we don't have such a huge genome to encode the huge number of B cell receptors we have just a restricted number of genes and by mixing Mixing and matching, we can generate different kinds of B cell receptors by a special phenomenon which is called as gene rearrangements or somatic recombinations which occur when the B cells are developing in the bone marrow. So we have for the, diff the antigenic specificity, the variable part of light chain and the variable part of heavy chain, we have specific genes, you know, number of genes and for constant region genes, we have separate, for, for the constant region, we have separate genes. So to encode the variable region, we have 
VH region, we have a DH region, and we have a JH region. Each of them having different, different multiple genes, 30 to 40 genes in each of these segments, right? So when the recombination starts to occur in the bone marrow, one of the genes from this diversity region and the joining region is randomly selected out by the recombinase enzymes encoded by RAG1 and RAG2, and they are joined up with each other. Okay, so splicing occurs, all the in intermediate, the introns and the, uh, the other genes are removed, and randomly one of these genes is joined up with the one of the genes from the joining region. So this, we have one recombination in the heavy chain gene locus located on chromosome 14. This is followed by another recombination where one of the genes from this region is selected out and is joined up with these DHJH genes. And we have a final gene which is going to encode for the variable part of the heavy chain. Okay, so by this random selection, we can generate so many kinds of different types of receptors, the variable parts of the heavy chain, right? Now, once this coming to what we are being asked about. Now, once this gene has been made, what did we have? We, let's go back to the previous slide. What did we have? We have multiple genes to encode for the variable part, of, for the constant part of the heavy chain. So we will have C mu, C delta, C gamma 3, C alpha 1, C alpha 2, and so on. Remember the different types of heavy chains. Right. So accordingly, we will have genes encoding the constant regions. Now, once this rearrangement has occurred to encode for the variable part, the primary transcript is containing all these constant regions genes along with this, this uh, joined up genes. Now, during the RNA processing, the B cell, when it is maturing, the final messenger RNA, because of alternate RNA processing or differential RNA processing or alternate RNA splicing, if the C mu gene is joined up with this VHDH, JH gene, we will have the messenger RNA for the mu heavy chain. And if the C delta gene is joined up, we will have the messenger RNA for the delta heavy chain. Right. So this is alternate RNA splicing. That is why we have IgD and IgM as the B cell receptors. I'm not going to do the light chain rearrangements because this I've discussed in my immunology lectures in marrow. Right. So this is what is happening. If C mu is joined up, we will get the mu heavy chain. And if C delta is joined up, we will have the delta heavy chain. Now coming to the other options. What is allelic exclusion? Now we have the maternal heavy chain gene locus and the paternal heavy chain gene locus. Now, if the rearrangement has occurred on either of these gene loci, maternal chromosome 14 or paternal chromosome 14, which is randomly selected out by the recombinases, once the rearrangement has occurred on one of the alleles, it could be maternal or paternal, it is going to inhibit the rearrangement on the other allele, which could be maternal or paternal, right? So once the rearrangement has occurred for one of the heavy chains, uh, of mother's or father's uh, chromosome, it is going to inhibit the rearrangement on the gene locus for the heavy chain located on the other allele. Similarly, once the light chain rearrangements have occurred on one allele, it is going to inhibit the rearrangement on the other allele for the light chain. This is called as allelic exclusion and this is responsible for the b cell having single antigenic specificity all the more than 1.5 b uh, lac b cell receptors should have the same antigenic specificity then there were two options which are somatic hypermutations and there was another uh, uh, option that was affinity maturation. They both mean one and the same thing. Now, what was earlier we were talking about somatic rearrangements, alternate RNA splicing, or we were talking about uh, the, this just now um, the, um, ec allelic exclusion. This was all occurring in the bone marrow. Now, once the B cells have been released out, they get activated they, when they recognize a certain antigen. Initially, the antigen activated B cells 
have a very low affinity for the antigen. So they secrete low affinity antibodies. But at that time, when they are being activated in the lymph node or in the secondary lymphoid organs, so many of these B cells will migrate to special areas in the germinal centers. They will undergo random point mutations in the hyper variable regions, which were meant to recognize the antigen. So these are random point mutations. Many of these point mutations may be absolutely useless. It, the B cell now loses its ability to recognize the antigen, but many of the mutations may be useful. And th at that time, that useful mutation in the sense it has the B cell now has an higher affinity for that antigen. Uh, this uh, The follicular dendritic cells will make only those B cells survive which are having this high affinity for the antigen. This B cells which are still having low affinity or no affinity for the antigen will be undergoing apoptosis, right? So generation of the B cells with high affinity for antigen, this is called as affinity has got matured. So if you're asked affinity maturation of the B cells, where does it occur? It occurs in the peripheral lymphoid organs once the B cells have undergone or they have got activated in response to the antigen. And how does it uh, get matured? By this special random phenomenon called as somatic hypermutation. This is a beautiful diagram. You can pause this diagram. In fact, I have talked about affinity maturation exactly two years back when this question was asked in the November INI set exam of 2020. I had shown a similar uh, diagram out there. There is our B cell, which has recognized an antigen. We have our T cell, which has been activated by the dendritic cell against the same antigen. The B cell will come to the T cell come and give me some signals for getting further activated. Now these B cells will undergo proliferation. They will migrate to special areas in the germinal centers, undergo what is called as somatic hypermutation. Now the follicular dendritic cells will give them a special signal. They will select out only those B cells which are secreting higher affinity antibodies. And these B cells will uh, then be uh, moving out into the circulation or they will start to secrete those high affinity antibodies. Next question, which of the following cytokines is not involved in a TH1 response? Okay, so interleukin 4, 2, 12 and interferon gamma. The answer to this question is interferon gamma. Now, this is a very simple question. I'm sure you all have studied that interleukin 4 is involved in a TH2 response. Now, helper T cells are basically, please remember, they are the generals. They are going to direct, okay, this is the kind of antigen that dendritic cell has brought to me. This is the kind of immune response I need to activate. So, naive helper T cells have not yet decided, naive meaning they have not yet recognized an antigen. They are not directed against a specific kind of immune response, cell mediated or humoral immune response. But once a dendritic cell recognizes an antigen wherever it it is initially it is going to take up this antigen it is going to recognize it by the toe like receptors on its surface and now it is going to uh, take up that antigen process that antigen into small small fragments in its lysosome conjugate that peptides of the antigen in the groove of the mhc class 2 and it is going to move out to the regional lymph node and here it is going to wait that during the peripheral recirculation of the, all the T cells in our body, some T cells will come and recognize this antigen that I'm presenting, rather the peptides of the antigen that I'm presenting in the groove of the MHC class 2, right? So here we have, it is going to wait out there, the T cells will enter that particular lymph node, and it is going to scan the surface of the dendritic cell. Do I recognize this antigen? If I don't, if it does not recognize it by its T cell receptor, it will say, bye-bye, I'm not interested. But any T helper cell which recognizes the peptides of that antigen in the groove of the MHC class 2 of the dendritic cell, it will form an immunological synapse. Now give me my signals. And now, now I'm going to become a general I'm going to direct an immune response. So here we have the dendritic cell, which recognized the peptide uh, with antigen in the periphery. It migrated to the regional lymph node, presented the peptides in the groove of the MHC class 2. The helper T cell, the naive helper T cell, recognized the peptides in the groove of the MHC class 2 by its T cell receptor. It got signal 1.
Then it said, give me my second signal. So this dendritic cell, it says, I, I am expressing B7, which will bind to the CD28 of the helper T cell. It says, I've got my signal too. Now the helper T cell says, I want my final signal. What kind of an antigen have you brought me? And that is directed by the dendritic cell in the form of the cytokine. This is the signal 3, which will tell the helper T cell to either convert into Th1 or Th2 or Th17. Okay, right. So this will lead to this Th1 will activate the macrophages to get rid of pathogens which are replicating within their vesicles. So this is participating in cell-mediated immunity in against intras uh, intracellular pathogens. Th2 cells will play an important role in humoral immunity against parasites, etc. And Th17 again will play a role in activation of the neutrophils whenever bacteria or fungi enter our body. Okay, so this is a quick review of the same what I just talked about. When the dendritic cell secretes the cytokine interleukin 12, this is the signal to the helper T cell to convert into a Th1 cell. And this, any helper T cell, when it forms an immunological synapse with the dendritic cell, it gets all the three signals. The first cytokine that it is always going to secrete is interleukin 2, right? This is going to help. So this interleukin-2 is going to have an autocrine action. It is going to bind to the interleukin-2 receptors on the Th1, uh, Th, uh, whatever cell it may be, and this is going to help it to proliferate, help it to enter the cell cycle. And now these Th1 cells will secrete which cytokine? The most important cytokine, interferon gamma. So which are the cytokines which are involved in Th1 response? Right here it is mentioned, interleukin-12, interleukin-2, and interferon gamma, right? So please remember, Th1 cells, what do they do? They activate the macrophages to destroy the ingested microbes. And also remember, which is the signature cytokine for Th1 cells? It is interferon gamma. Coming to our Th2 cells, this is a prospective question. When the dendritic cell, up after giving signal 1 and signal 2, if it secretes the cytokine interleukin-4, Th, the naive helper T cell will convert into a Th2 cell. And first of all, what will it secrete? Interleukin-2, it will proliferate. And which cytokines it will secrete? Interleukin-4, 5, and interleukin-13. So what do these cytokines do? They will stimulate the B cells to secrete IgE antibodies and activate the eosinophils and help to eradicate helminthic infections. And which is the signature cytokine of Th2 cell? It is interleukin-4, the most important cytokine. Thirdly, when dendritic cell secretes interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and interleukin-23, the Th naive helper T cell converts into Th17. It will first secrete interleukin-2, and then it will secrete interleukin-17, 22, and 21, which will basically activate the neutrophils to get rid of extracellular pathogens like bacteria and fungi. And which is the signature cytokine of Th17? The name itself is telling you 17 17. This is the most important cytokine. So remember, Th1 cells play a role in cell-mediated immunity to get to activate the macrophages to get rid of pathogens which are replicating within their within their endosomes. Th2 cells, what do they do? They have play a role in humoral immunity against helminthic pathogen. They induce the release of IgE antibodies by the B cells and activate eosinophils. And Th17 cells will get rid of bacterial and fungi by activating the neutrophils by secreting specific cytokines in leukin 17, 21, and 22. A four-year-old boy had high-grade fever for the last five days. His mother reports to the emergency that her son has had episodes of seizures and altered sensorium the night before. The peripheral blood smear shows the following findings as shown in the figure. How will you manage this patient? Okay, so we have a child who has had seizures and sensorium and the peripheral blood smear is like this. What can you see? You can see these trophozoites of plasmodium. And what can you see? 
the headphone appearance, the double chromatin dots. You can see multiple rings in within the RBCs. So what does this tell you? My diagnosis has plasmodium falciparum. And what is this child suffering with? Cerebral malaria. So we are being asked, what is the treatment for cerebral malaria? Of course, it is one of the artemisinin der derivatives or quinine or quinidine, right? So our, our, amongst these options, the only option that is mentioning artemisinin derivative is option B. So artesunate will be given at this much dose intravenously at 0, 12, 24, and 42 hours, 48 hours followed by atovacone and proguanil for three days. Okay, that's our answer. Right, so just a quick review of how do we treat cerebral malaria as I just, what was the answer to our question? Artisonate followed by atovacone and proguanil for three days. Or alternative is artimeter, that much dose on the first day, then reduce it to half for four days and then a standard course of atovacone proguanil for three days. Apart from these artemisinin derivatives, we can give quinine or quinidine. Quinidine IV loading infusion dose followed by a continuous infusion dose for at least 24 hours until parasitemia comes down below 1% and patient can take orally. And then we're going to follow up with the same at a work on proguanil for three days. Also, we can give quinine IV loading infusion dose and then eight hourly till oral therapy can be started and follow it up with quinine orally along with doxycycline for a total of seven days, right? So these are the drugs which can be used for the treatment of cerebral malaria. Our answer to this question was of this one, the top one. So our next question in parasitology was this. A very, very interesting question. I'm really in awe of the person who has set up this question. A 10-year-old boy noticed this the passage of a white thread-like worm in the stool. Microscopic examination of the anterior end of the worm is shown in the figure. So we have this figure. Can you see that there is, there is a rostellum and there are hooklets? The segments of the worm had breadth greater than the length. Now, the word segments is telling us that the question is talking about a cestode. And this cestode has a rostellum with hooks. And you can see, of course, these suckers for attachment, right? Now, can you identify which of the following eggs would be likely seen in the stool? What is this? This is the egg of Hymenolepis nana, the egg of Tinea, the egg of Ascaris, and this is the egg of Echino, or sorry, Enterobius vermicularis. So, what do we, or how did we arrive at the answer being Hymenolepis nana? Let us find out. We have been shown this image, and we have been given the second hint that the breadth of the segment is more than the length of the segment. So, this is not generally what I teach is that the broad tapeworm is diphylobotrium latum because that has segments broader than the uh, uh, the length of the segment. But the answer is not diphylobotrium latum because D latum does not have suckers on its colex for attachment. This is D latum which has grooves for attachment. These are the suckers which are present in the rest of the pathogenic cestodes, these kinds of cestodes. Now notice this has hooklets for attachment. This has no hooklets for attachment. Which one is this? Can anyone identify? This is unarmed tapeworm. What was this? This is tinea saginata. And the rest of this, you name them. Can you think of tinea solium? Or it could be Hymenolepis nana. Or it could be Hymenolepis diminuta. Or it could be Echinococcus granulosus. But Echinococcus does not have, we don't see eggs in humans because eggs would be seen in uh, dogs. That's where the adult worms are present. So this is absolutely ruled out. We have, so what is the answer? Tinea solium? No. Why? Because Hymenolepis nana, its segments are broader segments. Breadth is greater than the length. It's like, D later. So that's how we arrived at the answer by looking at the scolex, which has suckers for attachment, rather uh, no, suckers as well as hooklets for attachment, and the breadth was greater than the length. 
right? So that's the kind of egg we see. These oval egg, which has a hexacanth oncosphere in the center. And you can see these polar thickenings, the polar filaments, and the yolk granule, the egg of Hymenolepis rana. That's the egg of Tinea, sorry, Tinea species. And this is the egg of Ascaris. This is the egg of Enterobius vermicularis. Our next question on parasitology was an HIV positive male with CD4 counts 145 per cubic millimeter reports to the OPD with complaints of severe watery diarrhea. A very common question in AIMS. Acid fast stain of a stool specimen demonstrated acid fast round structures around the size of four to six microns. Which of the following is the likely etiology? Very simple, four to six micron structures in a patient, HIV positive patient with watery diarrhea. Our answer to this is cryptosporidium, right? So this is the size of the oocyst is telling us what is the causative agent, okay? Right. So please remember when we think of the coccidian protozoa, Cryptosporidium, in fact, rather, just as a general blanket statement, cryptosporidium is the most common cause of diarrhea in HIV patients, okay? Now, in all these three are under the class coccidia, cystoisospora, cyclospora, and cryptosporidium. And please remember the oocyst size is extremely important. In case of cystoisospora, it is 20 to 33 microns. In cyclospora, it is 8 to 12 microns. And in cryptosporidium, which was the answer in this question, it is 4 to 5 microns. When we see this oocyst in the stool specimen of the patient, the sporozoids are not present, meaning these are unsporulated oocysts. They will sporulate in the environment. The oocysts sporulate in the environment. But in case of cryptosporidium, the oocyst is also already containing the four naked sporozoids. So sporozoids are seen in the oocyst if we see closely, right? So size very important of the oocysts of either of these coccidian protozoa. Now moving on to questions in virology. Figure shows the life cycle of a virus in the human host. Which of the following viral proteins is oncogenic? So we have this kind of confusing picture, but if we see carefully, it is telling us that it is infecting the epidermis. And you can see some proteins, E1, E2, L1, L2, etc. Immediately, if you've studied human papillomaviruses, you can arrive at the answer. This is that we are being asked about the question, uh, human papillomaviruses. That's the genome of human papillomaviruses. Our question is, which of the following viral proteins is oncogenic? Again, very commonly asked question in uh, all our exams these days. Which are the viral proteins which are oncogenic? Answer to this is E6 and E7. Okay, so we have a HPV genome, which is a circular double-stranded DNA genome. And this genome, it encodes six non-structural proteins. Okay. So these help in replication of the uh, virus in the host cell, E1, E2, E4, and E5. And E6 and E7, these two non-structural proteins are the oncoproteins. So E6, this, what does it do? How does it induce carcinomas? It inactivates the product of the P53 gene. Okay, these are the tumor suppressor genes. And E7, this inactivates the product of the retinoblastoma gene. Again, so both these are tumor suppressor genes. The products are inhibited or inactivated by E6 and E7 respectively. Okay, the other two are the non-structural proteins encoded by the genome L1 and L2. L1 is the major capsid proteins. L2 is the minor capsid protein. L1 is what is incorporated in the vaccine, Cervarix, Gardasil, to provide our protection from these the cancers of uh, caused by human papillomaviruses. Okay, so Cervarix, Gardasil, these are all containing the recombinantly synthesized L1 proteins. This question was asked in session two. 
our next question was very very simple covid 19 regarding covid 19 sars covid can be detected by or diagnosed by all of the following except rapid antigen test to detect the spike proteins yeah so we have immunochromatographic tests then option b rt pcr to detect the rna c southern blotting that is our answer because southern blotting does is what does it detects it detects dna and sars virus are all of them are meaning corona viruses are all rna viruses so there is no chance of detecting the rna being uh, by southern blotting right so that's our answer option d was elisa to detect spike protein right so when we talk about blotting northern blotting southern blotting western blotting this is how we are going to remember what they detect by the this snow drop so southern blotting this detects dna northern blotting this detects rna and western blotting it detects protein so very simple question our answer was southern blotting okay the next question a patient presents with jaundice serum analysis reveals hepatitis d virus rna levels of something i'm not sure about the figures and hepatitis dna levels of something like this okay so the viral counts were given which of the following tells us that this is a super infection of hep a hepatitis d virus not a co infection of hepatitis b with hepatitis d okay so we all know that hepatitis d can only cause an infection in a person who is also having an infection with hepatitis d it's a defective virus okay it cannot synthesize the its envelope protein it's a hb s antigen on its own okay so it needs the co infection of hepatitis b or it can cause a super infection in a person who is already having hepatitis b infection so options amongst these i am not sure about the options what i got from the students were these igm anti hbc igg anti hbc positive anti hbs positive and hdv rna copies okay so they are asking us the fact that this is this is a super infection in this patient not a co infection the answer to this question is igg anti hbc positive now let us see what is a co infection and super infection co infection means it's a simultaneous the patient is getting infected with both hepatitis b and hepatitis d at the same time and super infection is when hepatitis b d infection occurs as following in a patient who is already having a chronic hepatitis b infection okay please also remember that co infection is less common but fortunately it likelihood of chronic hbv and hdv is less than 5% but in contrast super infection the more dangerous one is more common and the likelihood of chronic infection is as much as 90%. Now let us see what are the markers that we will find out in co-infection and super infection and which will help us to differentiate it's a co-infection or a super infection. In let's start with hepatitis B markers. HBS antigen in a co-infection will be positive? Yes. Super infection will be positive. Anti HBC we are talking about hepatitis b markers at present anti hbc because it's a recent infection what will be the type of antibody it will be igm but in case it's a super infection because it's a chronic hepatitis b infection this anti hbc will be igg the hepatitis b viral dna will be positive in both of them anti hbs which was one of the options that will be negative as long as this appears only after resolution of the infection so that is going to be negative in both the cases coming to the hepatitis d virus markers in case so let's start with the hepatitis d antigen 
this appears only early in the infection and disappears after some time. So in both cases, super infection, co-infection, it is early and transient appearance of hepatitis D antigen. Anti-hepatitis D viral antibody, IgM class, will be positive in both of them. We understand that because this is a recent infection, also in a super infection, it's a recent infection with hepatitis D. HDV RNA levels will be positive in both of them. So what is difference differentiating? It's a super infection from a co-infection. In case of a super infection, it is IgG antibody, which is present of anti-HBC. Whereas in a co-infection, it will be IgM class of anti-HBC. So that's why our answer to this question was Ig. This was the answer. It is a super infection. Which of the following viruses exhibits genetic reassortment similar to that of influenza virus? This was asked just six months back. We had the image-based question. And looking at the pictures, can you see there are segments of viral genome? Any virus which has a segmented genome shows the ability to undergo genetic reassortment. So this is influenza virus. So our answer to this is option A. Okay. I'm not sure about the wordings, please. Uh, whether it was, but uh, this is what has been shared to me by the students. These were the figures. Right. So how does genetic reassortment occur in a, in a virus which has a segmented genome? So if we have a strain A and strain B of the same virus, okay, so it could be influenza virus, could be rota virus, they have these segmented genomes. If they cause a co-infection, meaning they are infecting the same cell, so during the synthesis of the viral components and during the assembly of the viral components, some of the viruses will be like the parent viruses, but some of them will be reassorted strains. They have acquired some segment of the strain A and they have acquired some segments of strain B. So these are reassortments occurring, right? So segmented genome viruses, I'm sure you all know ROBA, which are these Rio viruses, orthomyxo viruses, that is influenza, this is rota, bunia viruses like Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, and arena viruses like Lassa fever, Sabia, Machupo, etc. Okay, so these are the viruses which can show genetic reassortments. They are commonly seen in the first two, less often reported, not significant in case of bunia and arena viruses. Incorrect regarding parvovirus B19 disease association with the respective patients. So when you think of parvovirus, you think of certain diseases straight away. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So easy, such an easy question. So in a child, it leads to erythema infectiosum, which is also called as fifth disease. Yes, this is a correct association. Hemolytic anemia, patient can develop, go into aplastic crisis. Absolutely right. Pregnant females can develop non-immune fetal hydrops. Yes, absolutely true because of uh, the transplacental transfer of the infection to the fetus. And young females, polymyalgia, rheumatica, this, has, this is not caused by parvovirus. Parvovirus does cause uh, arthropathy, which are small joint arthropathies in uh, children, uh, young children. Okay, so this association is incorrect. Polymyalgia rheumatica is not caused by parvovirus B19. So parvovirus, it's a very, very common infection. You know, uh, most of us, 50% of us get infected within childhood and about the age of 20 or so, we are all 80 or to 90% have already got infected with parvovirus. And most infections of parvovirus are asymptomatic. But when we talk of symptomatic infections, it is so easy to remember all these things. Age-wise, just remember them, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So in children, it leads to fifth disease or erythema infectiosum, that typical slap cheek rash on the face of the baby, child. Older children, they develop papillopurpuric gloves and socks syndrome. I'll show you a picture later. Right, so swelling uh, of the hands and feet. So, adults it leads to acute symmetric small joint polyarthropathies. 
in patients of hemolytic anemia, especially it is mentioned in questions as sickle cell anemia, it can lead to pure red cell aplasia. Immunodeficient individuals, primary infection with parvo can lead to pure red cell aplasia and primary infection in pregnancy about up to 30% there's transmission rates of to the fetus and that leads to non-immune fetal hydrops. Okay, so those were the six associations of parvovirus with the respective group of individuals. Vesicular rash is seen in which of the following? This is so damn easy. Hand, foot, mouth disease presents, the child presents with vesicular rash in the mouth, on the palms, on the, on the feet, right? So that's our answer, hand, foot, mouth disease. In dengue and Zika virus, we get petechial rash. In roseola and phantom, we get maculopapular rash, right? So hand, foot, mouth disease, a disease caused by the enteroviruses, the coxsackie viruses is characterized by either macular, papular or vesicular eruptions classically at these, at these sites. Most common cause is coxsackie A16 and enterovirus A71 and it can also be caused by others like coxsackie A6, A10 and sometimes even by coxsackie B viruses. But these are the commonest causes, especially this one Hand, foot, mouth disease is often associated with cases with meningitis. So meningitis can be seen in this enterovirus A71. So what are the important causes of vesicular rash? We're going to remember one is, of course, varicella, chickenpox, zoster or shingles, and herpes simplex, hand, foot, mouth disease, and of course, also in congenital syphilis. These are the important infectious causes of vesicular rashes. Next question, transmission of which of the following viral infections has been reported in India? This is again a repeat questions of AIMS exam. About three to four years back, it was asked. Which of the following is reported from India? Though, though the name does not suggest so, West Nile fever is reported very well from India. Yellow fever reported mainly from Africa and South America. Hendra, and, Hendra is reported from Northern Australia and Ebola is mainly reported from Africa. Only West Nile fever is reported from India. Right. So West Nile fever, a virus which is closely related to Japanese encephalitis, belongs to the family Flaviviridae. And wherever you can see the blues, this is the endemicity of West Nile fever. So you can see it is in India also. Right. So that's the transmission cycle of West Nile fever virus. So vector is the same as Japanese encephalitis, that is Culex. And birds like sparrows, crows, they act as reservoir hosts or amplifier hosts. Okay, and man as well as horses, these are dead end hosts. What do we mean by that? That the patients do not develop sufficient viremia to be able to transmit the infection to the mosquito during, uh, you know, when it bites. Right. So West Nile fever, most of the patients are asymptomatic. Those who are symptomatic will just have come, come with complaints of a febrile illness like fever, chills, myalgias and arthralgias. And about 1% of patients will develop CNS manifestations like encephalitis, meningitis, and acute flaccid paralysis. Right. Moving on to our next question. Six weeks following trauma, a 30-year-old male develops lesions which are shown in the figure. Infection with which one does not manifest like this? Whenever we see an image like this, the first thing that strikes us is sporotrichosis caused by the dimorphic fungus sporotrix shenkai. Right. So these are this is also called as nodular lymphangitis. Right. But similar symptoms can also be lesions can also be caused by other agents. We will see soon. So what are the options? Porothrix. Yes. Not Staphylococcus aureus, which causes botryomycosis, which manifests more of more like mycetoma rather than these kinds of nodular lesions spreading proximally along lymphatics. Mycobacterium marinum, which causes swimming pool or fish tank granuloma, sometimes can manifest absolutely similarly, and when, as well as nocardiosis. Cutaneous nocardiosis can present like this. So our answer to this question is Staphylococcus aureus. Okay. 
So sporotrichoid lesions or nodular lymphangitis can be caused by sporotrichosis. And what do we see on microscopy when we stain with hematoxyl and eosin stains? Asteroid bodies, right? So cigar-shaped yeast cells surrounded by a splendor hopely phenomenon. In case it is caused by nocardiosis, then cutaneous nocardiosis, what would we see? We would see typical slender branching bacteria, which can be stained by either modified ZN or gram stain. In case it is atypical mycobacterium like mycobacterium marinum, we would see acid fast bacilli on ZN staining. And cutaneous leishmaniasis also can manifest the same. And in that case on microscopy, what will we see? A mastigotes on genes are staining inside macrophages. So these are the causes of, and of course, there's one more, tularemia caused by Francisella tularensis. That can be diagnosed by antigen detection by fluorescent techniques or amplifying a gene by PCR, right? So these are the five important causes of nodular lymphangitis. That is nodules or nodulo-ulcerative lesions spreading along lymphatics. This is botryomycosis caused by Staphylococcus aureus, which more, can you see those sinuses? So this is more often resembling mycetoma. Our next question again was a googly. A forest worker developed skin lesions over the forearm. They initially started as macules, then became nodular. Biopsy examination of lesions is shown in the figure. True about the likely etiological agent or diagnosis. So what can you see? These are some skin lesions and what these can be easily identified as sclerotic bodies, muriform, copper penny bodies called medlar bodies. So keeping that in mind that the diagnosis is chromoblastomycosis, we have to find out the correct statement about it. These bodies that are seen on microscopy are the fungi engulfed by macrophages. This is an incorrect statement because these are the fungi themselves, not the macrophages which have engulfed the fungi. Infection does not involve the underlying fascia, tendons, and muscles. Absolutely right. It just remains restricted to the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. Remember, we've classified chromoblastomycosis under the subcutaneous mycotic infections. Option C says they are dimorphic and hence are found inside the body in the yeast form. Yes, they do look like rounded structures, right? But these are not the yeast forms of the pheoid fungi which cause this disease. Okay, so this is an incorrect statement because dimorphic fungi are only six that we need to remember, which are these sporotrichosis, steleromyces, blastomyces, der, um, histoplasma. Then we have uh, this one, paracoxidioides. Okay, so those are, and coccidioides. These are the six dimorphic fungi. So these are, this is also incorrect. Angio invasion can occur in patients with hematological malignancies. This is also incorrect. Generally, chromoblastomycosis never shows any angio invasion. When we think of angio invasion, think of two important fungal infections. One are the mucorils, rhizopas, mucor, etc. And the other is aspergillosis. Okay, they show angio invasion. Right, so our answer here is option B. It remains superficial. So chromoblastomycosis, also called as verrucous dermatitis. What is the causative agent? pigmented molds. They show hyphae, septate hyphae, which are brown in color. Pheoid dematiaceous molds like Fonsique, Phyllophora, Cladophyllophora, and Rhinocladila. And following the traumatic implantation, they can present in varied appearances, nodular lesions, verrucous lesions, or they can present as ulcerative lesions. Right? And they present as, though they are mold forms, when they get traumatically implanted, they become rounded and they show some septations, okay? And so like you can see septations out here, you can see septations, beautiful septations in this. So they look something like this. These are the medlar bodies or copper penny bodies, which are dark walled, thick, dark colored and thick walled copper penny bodies. <clears throat> A patient presents with lesions on the trunk as shown in the figure. The moment you see this figure, what do you see? Umbilicated lesions 
and you think of molluscum contagiosum, which is a pox virus. Which of the following will be seen on histopathology? Answer will be Henderson Patterson bodies. Remember, all pox viruses have the ability to replicate within the cytoplasm. So, HP bodies will be located in the cytoplasm. Okay. So, firm, white to flesh colored, dome shaped, pearly papules having a central umbilication. These are mollusca, the skin lesions due to molluscum contagiosum. Okay. Please remember that. This was a question recently asked that all prokaryotes, what kind of cell wall do they have? They have a peptidoglycan cell wall. But there is one special group which are lacking that cell wall. This is the class molecules. Molecules means soft skin. They don't have a cell wall. And what are these? They belong to the family Mycoplasmataceae. This question was asked in July INI set 22. So, Another commonly asked topic is mycoplasmas. Okay, so this which of the following is a member of the class molecules? The answer to that was urea plasma. So both these are lacking cell wall. Next question, which of the following will kill all microorganisms including spores? So basically we are being asked which are sporicidal. Pasteurization, ETO, formaldehyde and orthothaldehyde. Okay, the answer to this is 2, 3, and 4. These are sporicidal agents. Pasteurization is not able to kill spores. Okay. So what are the sporicidal methods? Phys amongst the physical method, we have steam and dry heat, which can kill spores. Amongst the chemical agents, which can kill spores are ethylene oxide, Aldehydes like glutaraldehyde, formaldehyde, orthothaldehyde, hydrogen peroxide, and per acetic acid. Okay, these are able to kill spores. Okay, I'm not sure this question came or not. Some students told me, yes, it has come. Alcohol-based hand rubs should not be used in which cases? Before touching a patient, after touching a patient, after touching a patient surrounding, and when hands are visibly soiled? The answer to this question is option D. When hands are visibly soiled, what should we do? We should do hand washing. Okay. So hand hygiene, the most important pillar of the hospital infection control, can be carried out either by using alcohol-based hand rubs or we can do hand washing using soaps. So in all cases, when you're touching a patient, surroundings and so on, before touching a patient, after touching a patient, uh, before after touching patient surrounding or carrying out any procedure, you can always use hand rubs, alcohol-based hand rubs. Exceptions you must remember. In which case is hand washing recommended? When hands are visibly soiled. Next, when after using the toilet, before eating or touching food and after handling patients with diarrheal illnesses. Uh, in all these four cases, go and wash your hands. In the rest of situations, have a hand rub in your alcohol-based hand rub in your pocket and you can manage with that. Okay. So in these four cases, we must use we must uh, go and wash our hands. So these were the questions which were asked in session one of the INI set November 22 exam. Now I'm going to be taking up questions on in, uh, or questions of session two. Most of these were, you know, slight modifications of the session one questions. So I'm not going to be discussing them in detail at all. I'm just going to go forward telling you the answer. You can go back to the explanation that I gave in session one. But where the questions were unique, yes, I will offer an explanation. So acid fast stain of a specimen showed the following microscopic appearance. Which of the following is the likely organism seen in the specimen? Now you can see this is slight change of that question we were asked on the uh, nocardia. Okay, we have shown uh, a picture of the gram stain of nocardia and we were asked which other stain can we use? for that. So here we have been shown that modified ZN stain. Can you see the pink rods, branching rods, slender rods against a blue background? This is the modified ZN stain. And what's your answer here? It is Nocardia brasiliensis. 
Why is it not mycobacterium tuberculosis? Because that would not show this kind of crazy branching. Why is it not mycobacterium lepri? Even that will not show this kind of crazy branching because branching bacteria are either actinomyces or nocardia. Why is it not actinomyces? Because they are not acid fast. Okay, so our answer is nocardia brasiliensis. Which of the following is our sporicidal? Plasma, etio, formaldehyde, and orthothaldehyde. Right. So again, we are being asked a sporicidal agent. All these are sporicidal. What is plasma? It is the use of hydrogen peroxide gas. So that is also sporicidal. So our answer is option D. I just told about sporicidal agents. And also remember, this is the order of susceptibility to methods of sterilization and disinfection. We are starting from hardest to kill to coming down to easiest to kill. So most difficult to er eradicate is prions, prions. And then we have bacterial spores and protozoan cysts. Next comes the mycobacteria, non-enveloped viruses. Next, fungi. Coming to vegetative bacteria, gram-positive are more resistant in comparison to gram-negatives. And finally, most easy to kill are the lipid-enveloped viruses. Thank God coronavirus was in lipid-enveloped virus. So that's why it was so easy. Just use alcohol-based hand rubs or do hand washing and you can prevent transmission. Question: Next question, peripheral blood smear present, presenting of a patient presenting with fever, headache, and malaise showed granulocytes with morula. So now, similar question. Here we have a granulocyte with morula. What were the causes of human granulocytic ehrlichiosis or anaplasmosis? It was Ehrlichia evingai or anaplasma phagocytophilum. What are the options mentioned out here? Answer is option D. Okay. So cysts will form morula, but the morula will be seen in monocytes there. Right, we've already done this before. Morula means a mulberry-shaped inclusion bodies. A patient diagnosed with leptospirosis was started on IV penicillin. Within one to two hours, the jaundice worsened and the patient developed tachycardia, breathlessness, hypotension. What is the most likely reason? We, are, we have just treated a spirochetal infection. This patient has developed a jaris herxheimer reaction. Okay, what were those? Cytokines, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and TNF-alpha because of the release of all those endotoxin and lipoproteins from the cell wall, right? So our answer is option D. So this is generally as uh, develops within the first 12 to 24 hours after infection, after starting of treatment. All of the following on traumatic inoculation into the skin skin can lead to skin manifestation as shown in the figure except we already learned the five causes of these kind of nodular lymphangitis our answer to this is option b corine bacterium minutissimum which causes erythrasma okay which looks something like this intertriginous areas we keep see this brownish or reddish discoloration and when you see it under woods lamp you will see this coral red fluorescence Okay, next question. This is again a repeat, a slight modification. Sh shows the life cycle of a virus in the human host. Which of the viral proteins are incorporated in the viral vaccine? We already learned that the major capsid protein is L1. And that when injected will in the form of Cervarix or Gardasil will induce immunity against those strains which are incorporated. So answer to this is option A, L1. A patient presents with jaundice. The same question we are being asked here in that was asking which of the following indicates co-infection of HBV and HDV and not a super infection of HDV over HBV. Okay, we already did that table. In case it's a co-infection, both HBV and HDV are infecting at the same time. So what will be the differentiating feature? Anti-HBC will be in this case, IgM, okay? Of course, these will be positive. These will be positive in either of the situations. This will indicate, this will be positive in super infection. And this will be positive in co-infection, okay? So that's our answer to this question. 
Right, we already did this. That's a repeat of what we've already studied. Which of the following images represents Ebola virus? Ebola belongs to the family filoviruses. And what do they look like? Philo derived from filament shaped viruses. Very, very long, as long as 1000 nanometers long. This is Ebola virus. Okay. What does this look like? These are adenoviruses, spaceship shaped. That's our coronavirus. That's our hepatitis, sorry, HIV. It has two copies of its viral RNA. Right. Ebola virus belongs to the family Filoviridae. This is how they look under the electron microscope. Okay. Remember, both Ebola and Marburg viruses are only reported from Africa, never reported from India. Epstein Barr virus infects B cells via which of the following? What's the receptor for Epstein Barr virus on B cell? It is CD21. Okay. It's also called as complement receptor. Another important thing to remember about Epstein-Barr virus is when it infects B cells, it leads to polyclonal activation of the B cell. All kinds of B cells with varying antigenic specificity start to secrete those heterophile antibodies, which are detected by the Paul Bunnell test, the monospot test. And finally, of course, Epstein-Barr virus infection leads to immortalization of the B cells. And that's the reason they are implicated in so many lymphomas. Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, and so many other cancers. Incorrect regarding parvovirus B19 disease association. So incorrect association amongst, yes, this is correct, this is correct, this is correct. SLE, papillopurpuric gloves and socks syndrome is seen in young children, older children rather. This is how it looks like. Pruritus, edema, and erythema of hands and feet, mainly seen in older children, meaning adolescents. Which of the following organisms has been reported to have an endemic transmission in India? God knows how many times this has been asked in AIMS exam earlier, now asked in INI set. So the name does not suggest so. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Crimea is somewhere around Russia. Congo is in Africa, but yes, this disease has been reported from India very well, especially from the states of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Okay, so this belongs to the family Bunia viridae, genus Narrowvirus, Crimean Congo. That's the endemicity of CCHF. It's one of the tick transmitted infections. Okay, India is, uh, yeah, this is where it is endemic. You can see here, sorry, I've included Pakistan also. That's our transmission cycle of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Vector is hard tick. And reservoirs are these kinds of animals. And there is also evidence of human to human transmission. So there are so many modes of transmission of CCHF to humans, either by the bite of the hard tick or by handling infected animals by other body fluids. And human to human transmission is also there. So that's our hard tick that has that hard shell on top. All right, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. There are two stages of this illness, hemorrhages. So pre-hemorrhagic stage, non-specific symptoms, fever, nausea, vomiting, etc. And hemorrhagic phase, lots of hemorrhagic manifestations, petechiae, GI bleed, urogenital tract bleed. And diagnosis can be done by detection of the antigen by ELISA and the serum or by RT-PCR. Mortality rates are 10 to 50 percent. Okay. By the way, anyone remembers which is the viral infection with the almost 100 percent mortality rates? You remember this was recently asked? Yes, that was rabies. Petechial rash is associated with all of the following except we have done this earlier. Roseola infantum is associated with a maculopapular rash, Zika fever, Kaisenur forest disease, dengue fever, all can be associated with hemorrhagic manifestations, hence can be presented with petechia. Right? That's our rash of six disease or Roseola infantum caused by HHV6, human herpes virus 6, and sometimes caused by HHV7. Okay. Another question on chromoblastomycosis, but with modified options. So the same thing was given. Biopsy examination showed these kinds of 
lesions, uh, these kinds of structures. So here we have to find out the true statement about the likely organism. Sclerotic bodies are the fungi engulfed by the macrophages. This is incorrect. These are the fungi themselves. Angio inversion can occur in patients of hematological malignancies. No, this is incorrect. Infection spreads deep and underlying to the underlying fascia muscles and are involved. This is incorrect. It just restricts to the subcutaneous tissues. There is no angio invasion. Yes, this option is correct. They are caused by feoid or dematiaceous fungi. We know their names. Fonseca, Cladophyllophora, Phyllophora, Rhinocladina. All these are feoid dematiaceous molds. Okay. And HIV positive, okay, the same question presents with severe watery diarrhea. But what are we seeing on acid fasting of the stool specimen, rounded structures, which are 8 to 10 microns in size? So what is our answer? We studied that earlier. It is Cyclospora chitinensis. A 10-year-old boy, I love this question again. A 10-year-old boy noticed the passage of thread-like worm in the stool. Microscopic examination of the anterior end of the worm is shown in the figure. Which of the following eggs would be likely seen in the stool? Now, can you see? This is the segmentation. These are the suckers for attachment, right? So this is a cestode which has no hooklets. So what is your diagnosis? This is tenia saginata. And what is the egg of tenia saginata look like? It looks like this. So our answer is option two. That's our unarmed tapeworm. And those are the eggs. Delayed hypersensitivity involves which of the following cytokines? Okay, so delayed hypersensitivity means it's a Th1 response. And which are the cytokines? We learned about it. Interleukin 12. Once they are stimulated, the Th1 cells will secrete interleukin-2. They will secrete interferon gamma, which is the macrophage activating cytokine. So what is the answer here? 1, 2, and 3. Option C. Interleukin-4 is involved in. Uh, so delayed hypersensitivity means cell-mediated, whereas interleukin-4 will be involved in IgE secretion. So this will be involved in. Interleukin-4 will be involved in type 1 hypersensitivity. Okay, right. Next question was again a repeat. Hereditary angio neurotic edema is due to defect in absence of which of the following? The answer is C1 inhibitor. With that, we have come to the end of our discussion of INS at November 22 exams. Please Nate, note that these are oft repeated topics. Of course, the question changes but the topics generally remain the same. So it would is great advice that you read, you listen to these questions, their discussions just before your exams. Bye-bye for now.